In the back of a dimly lit office of his family home in northern Italy, Francisco Balbi wrote feverishly by the candlelight. Several empty plates and piles of melted candle wax crowded his desk, but he didn't notice. In fact, once he had begun writing, it was impossible to stop. The words just seemed to flow out. Francisco was a rifleman. His job had taken him all over Europe. He had fought in some truly incredible battles and seen things his friends could scarcely dream of. But one experience towered above the others. It was a tale that every friend, merchant or townsperson had asked him to retell. Even his children had pestered him to tell the story. Was it true, they asked? Did one old man and a few knights really stop an army of 40,000? Truth be told, Francisco had trouble believing in himself, and he was there. On that tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, only two and a half years ago, he had seen it all. The pain, the suffering, the hunger, the lost friends, and the glory. Malta. As he looked down at his blistered fingers, he realised that his hands were shaking. It was still dark outside, at least a few hours until dawn. Lighting another candle, he cracked his knuckles and started writing again. This was a story that no one should ever forget. You're listening to Anthology of Heroes, and it's my pleasure to bring you the tale of La Valette, the thorn in the heel of Allah. The Great Siege of Malta, as it's known today, is in my opinion one of the, if not the greatest siege of all time. It has everything you'd want in a good story. A tiny island manned by an archaic religious order surrounded by enemies on all sides. In the red corner, La Valette, fighting with his back against the wall, with nothing to lose. In the blue corner, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, a renowned commander and conqueror, who, for the sake of his pride, had to flush away the last remnant of Christianity from his vast domain. This is my 20th episode, and I'm hoping you're enjoying the ride as much as I am. Let's get started. The Age of Crusades started in 1095. From his capital in Constantinople, that's modern Istanbul, the Byzantine emperor sent out a call of help to the Pope in Rome. The Pope used the call for aid to shore up his legitimacy across the Christian world, but even he was surprised by the response. By promising to absolve the sins of every man that answered his call, volunteers sprang up from all over Europe. Men from all walks of life answered his holy call, from kings to peasants and everything in between. With so many people flocking to the Levantine coast, that's the countries today like Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Western Turkey, etc., there was a huge need for essential services, starting with finances and medical care. The Knights Templar started a financial service, essentially the first pawn shop or line of credit in world history. A crusader could pawn off his horse, jewellery, castle, whatever, at one of the head offices in Europe and be given a certificate which he could exchange at a Templar office in the Holy Land for the agreed-upon cash value. The Knights Hospitaller, on the other hand, set up field hospitals for those injured in wars against Muslims. And yes, that's where the origins of the name hospital and the iconic Red Cross we associate medicine with came from. Over the years, there grew a need for a few armed soldiers to guard these services, and this eventually began to expand and expand again. Eventually, the Templars and the Hospitallers became the primary fighting force in the Holy Land, especially well known for their shock cavalry. These ventures became known as the Crusades, and once they began to wind down, about 120 years or so later, many of the European powers like France or Germany set up shop permanently, establishing independent states miniature kingdoms, carved out of the Levantine coast. The Templars and the Knights Hospitaller existed as an organisation within these kingdoms, but they also had headquarters all through France, England, Spain, all over Europe, even as far as modern-day Estonia. With so much money flowing through these organisations, they soon became very rich, and due to their line of work, they turned into expert siege engineers and castle builders. And when I say expert, I mean it. They built these things to last, If you don't believe me, you can see how many of them are still standing in very good condition to this day. But by the end of the 13th century, crusading fever had started to die down. The luster of retaking Christ's city in the name of the Lord had diminished, as those who returned from earlier crusades shone light on what really happened. 
battles in the burning desert heat, bouts of dysentery spreading through the camp, and fearsome Muslim warriors had people second-guessing if God's eternal blessing was really worth all that trouble. In 1291, Akka, the last mainland crusader state, fell to the Egyptian Mamluks, and with it, Europe's brief adventure in the Holy Land came to an end. But not everyone was ready to call it. The Templars and the Knights Hospitaller existed solely to wage war in the Holy Land. They had dedicated their lives to it, as had their fathers before them. If they weren't doing that, then what was the point of them? The Knights needed to reinvent themselves if they were going to survive, and for that, they needed a home base. Already slipping from their moral high grounds, the Knights attack and take the island of Rhodes. Rhodes was part of the Byzantine Empire, a Christian empire. And though they practiced a different kind of Christianity, it was still a shifty move for an order that was founded on protecting Christians. From their new base in Rhodes, the knights worked to shepherd Christian ships travelling through the Mediterranean Sea. And they did this well. Though it was a different kind of warfare, they soon got the hang of it, and they became excellent mariners and a serious nuisance to Ottoman and Mamluk trading efforts. But meanwhile, the Protestant Reformation began to create waves through Europe and the Catholic Church found its influence over European monarchs severely reduced. People began to question why the Pope was the only one who could communicate directly with God. What was stopping them? The Hospitallers were an arm of the Catholic Church, and if you were no longer supporting the Pope, you weren't going to go out of your way to fund his army. And so the charity for the group began to dry up. The Knights found themselves in a strange position, stranded on a rock with an impressive navy, enemies on all sides, and running low on funds. So, the Knights Hospitaller, the old guardians of the Holy Land, became pirates. They prominently targeted Muslim ships, but as time went on, many became less fussy and attacked Christian ships too. The order had come full circle, from protecting Christians on land to attacking Christians at sea. After this, the order's zeal for crusading began to break down somewhat as men gave into temptations. Many became decadent and lazy, growing rich, privateering for other nations, and acting more as mercenaries than soldiers of God. While the Christian nations of Europe could easily enough turn a blind eye to the occasional attacks, it was not so easy for the Ottomans or the Mamluks. Look across your street. Imagine if whoever lived in that house held you up for a few dollars every time you left the house. Now imagine if that person was half the size of you. The Ottomans and the Mamluks were humongous empires, so why didn't they just defeat them? Well, it wasn't that easy. This wasn't Captain Blackbeard and a few scallywags from Bristol. This was a religious order with centuries of military tradition to draw on. And while the years may have dulled their morality, it definitely had not dulled their military prowess. In 1444, the Mamluks attacked Rhodes and the knights sent them packing. In 1480, the Ottomans took their shot and the knights pushed them back into the sea. Finally, in 1522, a colossal Ottoman army of around 60,000 men with 150 ships, forced the knights out of Rhodes. The Ottoman sultan was generous with his terms, and most of the knights were allowed to leave freely. The remnants of them were dumped in Sicily, and they wandered around Europe for a while. I'm imagining a group of iron-clad soldiers with a sign saying, we'll crusade for food, but who knows. Anyway, in 1530, the Holy Roman Emperor, that's like the ruler of most of Germany, Austria, and Italy, granted the homeless knights some land another island in the Mediterranean. But it was not a fertile and lush island like Rhodes. Instead, they granted them the tiny rocky outcrop south of Italian Sicily. They were given Malta. The island of Malta sits smack in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, south of Sicily and north of Libyan Tripoli. The island is 316 kilometres, or 193 miles, squared, making it the 10th smallest country in the world today. The archipelago is made up of two islands, the main island, Malta, and the smaller island, Gozo. Then, as is now, the people of Malta are a mix of Arab and Italian, as is their language, Maltese. The island had changed hands several times over the centuries, its prospects waxing and waning with the empire that controlled it. And over time, the people that lived there developed a unique dress sense and distinct cultural identity that was neither Arabic nor Sicilian, but something just in between. While this cosmopolitan island was very much home to the Maltese, when the knights were granted the island after eight years of homelessness, it was with grumblings and grimaces. The place was far from the lush and fertile grounds they'd grown used to. Wood was incredibly scarce, as was water, 
the island having no natural springs. The tough, barren ground was no good to grow corn or other grains, and in their place were melons and figs. The populace, too, spoke an unfamiliar dialect of Arabic, foreign to their ears, and they lived in relative poverty due to the constant yearly attacks from North African pirates. It's fair to say that if the order had other options, it would have been a thanks but no thanks to settle on Malta. But they didn't. It was this or nothing. While there were lots they didn't like, there were two things they did like. The harbours. The harbours on the northern part of the island were a defensible dream. Two fingers of land stretching north with only a narrow space between them. A blind man could see that these would make for fantastic killing grounds for coastal batteries and bastions. Once the knights landed, they immediately set work fortifying it. As they were prominently seafarers, the de facto capital of the island, a small inland city called Medina, was of no interest to them. If the inhabitants explained to them that this placement was strategic, a fallback when pirates came raiding, their concern would have been brushed away. Piracy would still take place, for that it was a certainty, but the direction of it would be reversed. Instead of the pirates coming to Malta, they would be coming from it. While the island was only a tiny speck on a map, the knight's arrival had not escaped the all-seeing eye of one man. Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent brooded over the appointment, weighing up his options carefully. In the last 30 years, the Ottoman Empire, already enormous, had grown tremendously in size under his rule. A plaque written by Suleiman himself says this, quote, I am God's slave and sultan of this world. By the grace of God, I am the head of Muhammad's community. God's might and Muhammad's miracles are my companions. I am Suleiman, in whose name the Habdul is read in Mecca and Medina. In Baghdad, I am the Shah. In Byzantine realms, the Caesar. And in Egypt, the Sultan, who sends his fleets to the seas of Europe, to the Maghreb and to India. End quote. And he wasn't lying. From Belgrade in the north to Baghdad in the east, Tripoli in the west and Kassala in the south, Cities fell like dominoes before the mighty sultan and his forces, many of which he led in person. It was he who had finally dislodged the troublesome knights from Rhodes 32 years ago. So when his advisers may not have regarded this tiny band of men as any form of threat, he knew better. He had lost around 40,000 men to them last time. In what the sultan may refer to as a youthful folly, he had let the knights leave their battered island carrying with them all their precious relics and artefacts that inspired them to hold out for so long. And on that day, as the sad and bedraggled procession marched out of their ruined fortress, many of the men thought of this as only a temporary setback and that one day in the future they would have their chance at revenge. One of these men was a 20-year-old French nobleman named Jean de la Vallette, or Parisot to his friends. Vallette had come from his family domains in northern France to serve the order. He had grown up in a distinguished noble family, and many of his ancestors had served in the Crusades over the centuries. He was handsome, spoke several languages, and was fanatically loyal to his order. As he marched past the Ottoman troops towards the docks and away from his home, it's hard to envision the emotions that raced through him, but one can imagine revenge would have been somewhere towards the top. So, Valette, like all other knights, had to get used to his new home in Malta. But his life there did not start with the godliness you might expect for a soldier of Christ. Despite the knight's vow of celibacy, he fathered at least two bastard children, likely a few more. He earned himself a few months in an underground dungeon for beating a man to a bloody pulp after an argument, but eventually he pulled himself together and he was nominated to serve as the governor of Tripoli in northern Africa for a period of time. But the true test of a knight's mettle lay elsewhere, and he was eager to prove himself up to the task. It was the place where the fortune of men changed with the tides, the wild west of the 16th century, the Mediterranean Sea. What made the sea so wild? Well, in the earlier years of his reign, Sultan Suleiman introduced a kind of state-sponsored piracy into the Mediterranean. Privateers were armed and supported by the Ottoman state, and they were allowed a virtual free reign. Treasures, slaves, whatever it was, it was all theirs, and the only rule was that they leave Ottoman vessels well alone. For both parties, it was a great deal, and some of the best and brightest in the Ottoman navy were recruited through this. But one stood above all, a Turkish corsair known as Dragut. This man's reputation on the high seas was something near a god, the drawn sword of Islam, the uncrowned prince of the Mediterranean, the greatest pirate warrior of all time, 
These were but a few of the names he was known by. Every inlet, sandbank, ravine, or delta, Dragut knew like the back of his hand. No island, convoy, or coastal battery was safe from him. The people of Malta knew him especially well, as it was he and his men who returned almost yearly to raid and plunder before the knights arrived. But even for the drawn sword of Islam, some days you just run out of luck. One day, as Valette surveyed the recently captured prisoners from a raid, one man made a commotion, swearing angrily, furious at his capture. Though dirty and bloody, Valette recognised him instantly. Turning to the man, he said, Monsieur Dragut, it is the custom of war, he sympathised. In other words, that's just how it is sometimes. And change in fortune, Dragut shot back at him. Soon enough, each man would see how right the other one was. When only a few years later, Valette found himself chained up, a victim of the custom of war, just like Dragut had been. And remembering his sympathetic comment from years before, Dragut secured slightly better working conditions for him. It's perhaps thanks to him that Valette managed to survive. Both men were eventually released back to the other side as a prisoner exchange, but not before being subjected to the life of a galley slave. To say the life of a galley slave was tough is the understatement of the century. A slave would be worked 10, 12, or even 20 hours at a time with no rest or break. As they worked, an officer would walk the lines between them and stuff a piece of wine-soaked bread in their mouth to keep the man from fainting from exhaustion, all while being beaten, whipped, and abused. If anyone fell over-exhausted, they would be whipped continuously until they kept rowing, and if that didn't work, they were flogged until they died and their body was thrown overboard. There was not much I can think in life that would test a man's fortitude more than this. If you could survive this life that could be anything from six months to a decade, then you were not just tough, you were almost superhuman. And both Dragut and Valette had passed the test. Once he was released, Valette returned to Malta, where, after the death of the old Grand Master of the Order, he was unanimously elected as the new leader of the Knights Hospitala. The 62-year-old man was an obvious choice. Though there were a few blotches on his past record, none could doubt his dedication to the order or his knowledge of the enemy. His first order of business was a census. Reports were done on the availability of food, manpower, gunpowder, water, but most of all, defence. Since their arrival 27 years ago, the last Grand Master had done well in turning the island into a formidable bastion, but he had always seen their exile to Malta as a temporary retreat, and so he had treated their defences as such. Valette was under no such misconceptions. He missed Rhodes too, but he was a realist, and knew that based on their current fortunes, they would probably never retake their coastal homeland. So he got to work turning their island into a bristling fortress. Valette knew there was a storm brewing, by far the biggest the order would ever have to endure. Two new forts were built to protect the main harbour. These were state-of-the-art, Built by Spanish engineers, they were designed in the modern star-shaped style, designed to hide weak points and maximise sections for crossfire. Despite the difficulty, these forts, where possible, were constructed on solid rock. No countermining sappers would be able to bring these things down. These were to become known as Fort St. Elmo and Fort St. Michael. Studying the last few raids from Dragut, ditches were dug and rampants were erected at the usual raiding spots. Valette's plan was one of strategic withdrawal. Each layer of defence needed to be held for as long as humanly possible. Only in this situation could they have any hope of holding out until outside assistance arrived. The cost of these upgrades was formidable, and Malta was much less bountiful than Rhodes. Everything had to be imported, even wood. The fact that he was able to finance this is a testament to his administrative skill. Doubling down on piracy, he set his men about busily in search of plunder across the Mediterranean. And although there were some big scores, it was still not enough. So, rooting round in the archives, Valette discovered that there were many debts from foreign powers, decades or centuries old, dating back to the golden age of the order. He immediately sent debt collectors to hassle European powers to pay up, a few of which begrudgingly did so. The moral decay of the troops was also addressed. Years of easy living and excess free time had had the men falling into bad habits like gambling, drinking, or living outside the barracks. This changed quickly. By 1564, the writing was well and truly on the walls. 
Friends of the Knights in Constantinople wrote to Vallette telling him of the extensive imports of raw materials they were seeing moved through the capital. The reports were written in lemon juice that was invisible to the naked eye and were only revealed under certain lighting conditions, meaning they went under the radar of Suleiman. It was clear that Judgment Day was near. Although pessimistic, Vallette sent out calls to help across Europe for men, money or supplies. The knight's call rang out to all, Protestant or Catholic, to remember what the order had once done for all of Europe. Philip II of Spain, the order's rightful lord and the one who provided the islands to them originally, was the only one they could have any hope of relying on. His envoy, Don Garcia de Toledo, sailed into Malta and encouraged the men to stand tall, telling them that he had petitioned Philip for 25,000 men to bolster their numbers, and he hoped they would be rallied soon. Words like hoped and petition were worth little, and the knights knew it. Vallette had all women, children, and the elderly shipped off Malta. Whoever was left on the island had to be prepared to fight. Political dissidents who spoke of surrender were also sent away. For the order to have any chance, everyone needed to be single-minded in their goal, endure and survive. Every able-bodied man was conscripted. The natives of Malta were separated into good, average or poor, depending on their ability to fire a musket straight. Blacksmiths worked around the clock, and the clang of hammer and tong rang out endlessly across the archipelago. Strict punishments were created to stop men performing foolhardy heroism and bravery. They simply did not have the numbers for it. The final count came in. With 600 knights and 8,000 Maltese militiamen, it was on Valette to hold the line against the full might of the Ottoman Empire. Let us smoke out this nest of vipers, Suleiman told his men, as his enormous navy sailed out the Golden Horn and towards Malta. On the 18th of May, 1565, Ottoman ships were sighted on the horizon. The day had come. Though expecting a large force, Valette did not likely expect one of this size. 180 war vessels, plus a handful of merchant ships, came into view and began disembarkment on the island. The knights could only watch in horror and awe. The Sultan's finest were out first. Wading into the warm Mediterranean waters came 6,000 Janissaries. Christian converts from the Balkans, trained in all arts of warfare, they were the best of the best. Next came 9,000 Sapahi cavalry, once the pride of the Byzantine army, now just another regiment in the Sultan's forces. After that came 4,000 Yayalas, specialists who were brought along for their experience in explosives, then another 4,000 religious fanatics, and the rest was made up of conscripts, adventurers, militia, and pirates from across the huge empire the Sultan ruled. Around 40,000 men in total. Coming in last were the cannons, from simple muskets to great bombards longer than a car. Slowly and carefully, these enormous beasts were brought on shore. The Ottoman military tech was among the most advanced in the world, and the Sultan had enjoyed victory after victory thanks to it. After surveying the island, the Sultan's spies sent word to him that the siege should not take longer than a few days. As if reading their minds, Vallette turned to his men and reminded them of their oath. Quote, it is the great battle of the cross and the Quran which is now to be fought. A formidable army of infidels are on the point of investing on our island. We, for our part, are the chosen soldiers of the cross, and if heaven requires the sacrifice of our lives, there can be no better occasion than this. Let us hasten then, my brothers, to the sacred altar. There we will renew our vows and obtain, by our faith in the sacred sacraments, that contempt for death, which alone can render us invincible. End quote. As the last of the men retreated into their fortresses, all crops, buildings, and huts were burnt down. Dead animals and poisonous herbs were dumped into every well left on the island. It had begun. And that's part one of Valette, the thorn in the heel of Allah. The second and final part will be live in two weeks. This is Anthology of Heroes, and thanks again for listening. A big thank you to the show's Patreons, Luke, Malcolm, Tom, and Claudia. A lot of people don't realize it, but this is a one-man show, so there's quite a bit of time that goes into producing it. 
I love sharing these stories, and it means a ton knowing that there's people out there who are really enjoying them. You guys help me keep the cost down for things like web hosting, sound libraries, books, and stuff like that. If you're not a patron already, we've got some cool rewards up, like having the option to read out some quotes I use in the show. If you want to have a look, tap the link in our bio.